the problem with donor occupation is as follows. In the 1990s, and actually earlier in the 80s, uh, Ralph Nader used to talk about uh, Washington as corporate-occupied territory. And his argument was, you walk up and down the halls, and everybody is on on somebody's payroll. In other words, you're receiving lobbyist money to to make decisions that are favorable to this or that corporation or industry. Now that still goes on, but today we have something that's a little different, insofar as we have what I call oligarchs, billionaires, people with huge quantities of money who are in a position to dramatically shape policy making. Right now, the focus in policymaking has been war in Ukraine, open borders, and war in the Middle East. Now, why would Americans have any interest in what happens in Ukraine? The United States has never had any strategic interest whatsoever in anything happening in Ukraine, let alone eastern Ukraine. There's nothing there that we buy. There's, there's no one there that we, we would sell anything to. So why are we suddenly interested in Ukraine? We need to ask that question. The answer is we're not. The American people have no interest in that whatsoever. Then why are we pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into Ukraine and into a government that the CIA helped to install through a coup in 2014? Well, who is interested in Ukraine? (laughs) Now you have Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, who is currently... uh, discussed as the likely individual whose organization, BlackRock, will rebuild Ukraine whenever the war ends. Gosh, that's interesting. Have you ever heard of anything like that in the history of the United States where we went to war somewhere and we knew that when it ended, we knew exactly who the corporate head was who was going to lead the uh, rebuilding effort and we had set aside a trillion dollars for the purpose? I mean, stop and think about that. So who is Larry Fink? People need to look him up, figure out why is he interested in Ukraine? What is his relationship with Tony Blinken, uh, with uh, Biden, the Biden White House, the administration, any of the leading figures in the cabinet? Uh, Why would he want to do this at all? And is there not something else even more lucrative for BlackRock to invest in? So, you know, people need to follow the trail that leads to answers to those questions. And they'll begin to understand, you know, why are we so committed at this stage to an offensive war that Israel wants to wage with virtually the entire region? Remember, this all began uh, ostensibly on the basis of the 7 October attack. Well, the 7 October attack has uh, been debunked in many respects in that all of the, not all, but most of the horrific atrocities associated with decapitating babies or baking babies in ovens and mass rapes and murders and so forth. Many of that, many of those assertions have turned out to be false. We know that. Secondly, you know, I was in Israel in 2020 and I actually visited the headquarters that sat right outside of Gaza that was responsible for securing the area. Uh, I thought the security was airtight and they had covered every conceivable base that you could. They knew who was doing something in Gaza almost before the individual inside Gaza knew he was doing it, to the point where uh, someone in Gaza took a shot at an Israeli soldier in one of the guard towers that overlooked this giant sort of uh, barbed, wired, fenced-in concentration camp, and they knew which person had actually fired the round. I mean, they, they, they had this thing nailed. Now, we also know that before this began, there was a group of Israeli women. These were women serving in the Israeli Defense Force who were given the responsibility to monitor everything that was happening inside Gaza. It was an intelligence sale. So, and you have to understand the Israelis are very smart in the way they utilize human capital. When you come into the Israeli Defense Force, they put you through a battery of tests and they determine where you can be most useful and helpful to the national defense. And then they assign you accordingly. So these women were picked up for their intelligence, their understanding, uh, their command of languages and so forth. And they reported that there were preparations obviously underway inside Gaza for a very long time, indicating that something really big was was building. 
And they kept telling people and telling people and telling people, telling the chain of command, the people who were in charge. The answer was, well, thank you very much. We've got that covered. Nothing changed. Then you had the deputy chief of intelligence in Egypt, the Egyptian military, the day before the attack, who called to warn that this attack was imminent and described that it could be very dangerous. And he was thanked for his interest in Israel's national defense and nothing was done. And then you had this long delay before Israeli forces actually show up on the scene, and then they start killing everybody. And I'm, when I say everybody, I'm also talking about, unfortunately, a number of Israeli citizens, along with whatever else they could find that was moving out of the country into back into Gaza. The whole thing is very, very suspicious. And then suddenly, instead of uh, this vengeance campaign designed to permanently disabuse Hamas of the wisdom of ever trying something like this again, it becomes a scorched earth policy of mass murder and expulsion. In other words, we're, we're now going to wipe out Gaza. And after Gaza, we're going after the West Bank. And oh, by the way, we're going after Hezbollah. And then you have uh, weeks later, Netanyahu who's saying, well, now's the time for us to settle accounts with everybody. And we discover that he has the United States Armed Forces effectively under control of Israeli national military power. And that the American people haven't been consulted on any of this. They're simply saying, oh, yeah, sure, we should support Israel and help Israel defend itself. Yeah, but this has very little to do with defending Israel. This has a lot to do with militarily establishing Jewish supremacy in the Middle East. Do we really want to sign on for a war that pits Israel against everyone in the region? hundreds of millions of Muslims. How does this help us? That question never comes up. Instead, we deploy three carrier battle groups, uh, hundreds of aircraft, dozens of ships, submarines, uh, along with special operations forces and, and other elements of the Army and the Marine Corps. And then we wait, and we wait, and we wait until Netanyahu decides when and how he will attack Iran. And we hear that we are now part of this imminent attack on Iran. Now, this means a, a declared war. No, there's no declaration of war. There is no debate in Washington, no discussion. Gosh, isn't that a little odd? But then again, there was never any discussion or debate in Ukraine or about Ukraine or whether or not we should go there. All, all these things seem to flow very, very rapidly without much question. So why is this the case? Well, how much money is involved? Who's getting the money? Now, we already know that dozens and dozens and dozens of members of Congress show up and they may be worth 150 to four or 500,000, occasionally a million, and they all leave as multimillionaires. Where does all of this money come from? Who is bankrolling it? Who is pushing it? And, and that's what you've got to go back and look at the not just the industries and the corporate groups, whether it's, you know, an organization like Raytheon or Lockheed Martin that obviously profits enormously when large numbers of missiles and rockets and so forth are, are utilized. That's one piece of it. Who else? Who wants this? And what is this thing called the American-Israeli Political Action Committee that has billion, billions of dollars ostensibly in its at its beck and call. And that's money is not coming from Israel. That comes from within the United States. That's why APAC, the Israeli lobby, as we call it, is not a foreign lobby. Its money originates inside the United States. Who is behind APAC? Who is contributing this money? And how does this money drive the United States into what looks like a regional war, beginning with a major attack on a foreign country without any debate, without any vote, without any discussion. The same thing happened with Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Suddenly, overnight, Russia is transformed into evil incarnate that has to be destroyed. Again, no debate, no discussion. It's, it's suddenly delivered as a fait accompli. Americans are asleep. They're not paying any attention. And one of the problems is that most Americans, most of the time, Jay, don't pay attention to what happens overseas. They're concerned with what happens here, which is appropriate. I agree with them. This is where we should be focused. There's nothing more important overseas than what's happening here in the United States. And I think perhaps more recently, the abysmal failure of FEMA 
uh, to do anything effectively about the mess that created by the last hurricane, leaving people stranded, hundreds of people dying, people contemplating suicide because they felt hopeless after the loss of their families and houses. And now we're and then being told, well, we don't have any money, we can't spend any money, but at the same time, we can send another $567 million to Taiwan. You know, again, have we had any discussion or debate about this? Or billions that are going over to Ukraine, or how many billions are going in every day in the Middle East? That all goes without question and, and no discussion but we can't seem to spend effectively to support Americans who are in desperate condition. And now we have another hurricane coming through. What is going to happen now? Uh, you know, it's, it's not just America last it's America is not even seriously considered. Hmm. Why? Well, you've got to go back to donor occupation. Who are the donors? Where's the money coming from and how much money are we talking about that each congressman or a member of the Senate ultimately benefits from. And remember, there are various ways to benefit. Certainly, they'll put money into your uh, re-election campaign fund, whether it's the defense industry or the, or the Israel lobby or some other lobby. But there's also the benefit of aligning yourself with these lobbies. They can, they can arrange for lucrative deals for you, especially after you leave office, if you retire from the military. They can give things to you, opportunities to you that you might otherwise never get. So it's a, it's a complex picture, and it's a desperate situation that we're in right now. We don't have control over anything. But I can guarantee you that Mr. Netanyahu has infinitely more control over what happens with U.S. armed forces and American foreign policy than you or I or any group of American citizens. And, you know, you mentioned that the public's asleep and they're not paying attention. But then you talked about the media. And I thought, yeah, the media, I mean, the public is paying attention. They aren't asleep. They think they're being virtuous, right? They think yeah, they're right. understanding the scenarios, but they're being fed the narratives that have been crafted. And, you know, it drives me and likely you crazy, but also you can't fault the people to a huge degree if all they're being fed is garbage and they're just eating it, right? It is what well, it is. Well, I, I, I agree with you to a point, but I think you can blame the people because if you're serious about a republic, that means that you are voting people into power to represent you. Now, you have to pay attention to who that is. How many people really know who the people are that represent them? Hmm. Do people actively involve themselves in the selection of these uh, representatives in the primaries? Where do these people come from? I mean, the whole political process in this country is in trouble. If you want to run for the Senate, the average cost of a senatorial campaign now is about $20 million. In most cases, if you want to be a senator, the expectation of the party structures, if you want to call them that, is that you will finance yourself. In other words, if you can't come in and ante up at least 10 of the 20 million on your own, people are reluctant to support you. Same thing is true at the congressional level. Now, there are places that are more expensive than others, but it's not unreasonable to expect a, a congressional campaign on average to cost a couple of million dollars. So mm -hmm. once again, who ends up running? Well, in many cases, you do get people that already have a substantial chunk of cash under their belts. You know, Mulvaney, who uh, ran for office and then served briefly as chief of staff of the White House, I think he, as an attorney, had closed some lucrative deals and was worth a few million dollars and was able to finance his campaign. Uh, I think Andy Biggs uh, from Arizona won the lottery. So he was able to largely finance his campaign. Otherwise, you have to prostitute yourself to someone. You have to sell your soul. You know, if you look at someone like Pompeo, he was able to get elected because he effectively pledged undying allegiance to the Koch brothers. Mm. And uh, if you're willing to become someone's uh, puppet in, in terms of voting on the Hill, then you'll get their support. And you have to have people's support with a lot of money in order to make it into office. This means that you're corruption to some extent is baked in, isn't it? I mean, how do you get there to begin with? Uh, you know, there's a man named Buck who is leaving uh, the Congress. He's from Colorado. He's out from Westminster, Colorado. That's where his district is. He wrote a book, uh, The Swamp is Deeper Than You Think. I urge everybody to read it. He talks about what it's like to be elected to office and then the cold, hard facts. 
you know, if you want to uh, sit on a committee and have any influence while you're here over legislation, you have to pay us X amount of money, which goes to the Republican National Committee or the Democratic National Committee. If you want to sit on a particular committee in the in the House, then you have to pay another amount of money in order to effectively buy your seat on that committee. This this runs into hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he said, well, I don't have it. And the individual who's briefing them said, oh, yes, you do. Just look behind you. There's a building behind you. Well, that's the K Street lobbyists. In other words, all the big corporations, whether it's Monsanto uh, or anybody else. I mean, we could just go down the list. Hey, they, there's money there. Go get it. And then you give us the money and you get to sit on the committee and you have a say in things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is this government? Is this democracy? It's kind of ridiculous if you stop and think about it. Uh, so I don't know what we call it anymore. But the notion that we have a republic that is remotely responsive to the actual needs of the American people is a bit silly. I think Americans are easily beguiled with arguments based on democracy and human rights and goodness. They want to believe that we're always uh, the men in white hats that show up to rescue everyone from disaster. It's not that way. In fact, we've caused millions of people to lose their homes, to be, to you know, end up in sheer and terrible poverty in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. We've killed hundreds of thousands. Some people think we've killed over a million. The bottom line is, here we are again. What are we doing in Ukraine? What is this regime that that Zelensky runs? Who is he? Where did he come from? He was a comedian, Russian-speaking comedian, out of nowhere, who's picked up by an oligarch. We, he ends up being installed, uh, and we use him as our man to fight Russia. I mean, his his Ukrainian was so bad at the beginning, he had to spend months learning how to speak it properly. Hmm. What are we doing? You know, and, and Ukraine is an organized crime state, much like Mexico. How many tens of thousands of women and children have been trafficked out of Ukraine under Zelensky? He shuts down Orthodox Christian churches. He prosecutes any opposition. He outlaws any ulterior alternative party or structure. Look, it's a disaster. But what do we hear? Uh, the Ukrainians are a brave people defending their democracy. Are you out of your mind? That's nonsense. 600,000 Ukrainian soldiers are dead. That country may never recover. Millions have left it. It's a catastrophe. Fast forward to the Middle East. What are we doing now? Are we helping the Israelis to become more secure or are we actually helping them to commit suicide? Because as I see it right now, they're on the path to fighting not only everybody in the region, including ultimately at some point the Turks, but then also the Russians. So what what are we doing? And how does any of this serve our interest? How does this help us? 